Good evening, everyone. Um, and great thanks to Emily um, and Amanda um, and Valeria, who can't be here tonight. Um, it's been a long time. I've spent years trying to develop a curriculum in sustainable living here at Manchester Metropolitan University. And it's very heartening to know that last year we've been awarded Brilliance University. Um, over the past five years, there's been a, a real concerted effort to actually be sustainable as a university. To actually name our nail our colours to the mask. People have actually been employed. It's amazing that there are now people who are being employed specifically with environmental and sustainability reasons. This is revolutionary. Okay. It's also really interesting to know that a lot of this was actually driven by the students and by the students' union who actually pressurised the university into taking matters of global warming and climate change and sustainability seriously. Welcome, come in. Ah. Sorry. Not at all. job in blues. Right, uh, without whom, um, we wouldn't have a sustainable campus and all the initiatives that have gone ahead. And particularly with things like the development of Burley Fields, the new campus, uh, and the initiatives that are being put there. I'm not going to give you a story about art tonight. Um, I am an artist, and I'll address that during part of what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to actually deal with different narratives that, as an artist, um, I've uncovered or have been presented to me. And one of those things, uh, as part of the introduction, suggested that um, it was, and perhaps still is, quite unusual to have somebody who is an artist addressing climate change as an issue. But I'll talk about that in a minute. In 1984, Scottish artist Eduardo Pelozzi uh, had an exhibition at the Museum of Mankind in London. Uh, the exhibition was called Lost Magic Kingdoms. And the catalogue for that exhibition included um, a handwritten piece of script. And in that script, Pelotzi called for a change in thinking. And what he wrote was, um, what we need is a new culture in which way problems give way to capabilities. Um, it helps if you do it with a Scots accent, I'm not going to do that now, but the which way bit is a very Scots way of phrasing that. I liked the idea that the problems were giving way to capabilities. Not only were they giving way, but they were actually showing the way to the capabilities. Um, so that idea of becoming capable in something uh, has become a kind of mantra for me over the years. During this hour, just under 50 minutes now. I'm going to try and create a dialogue with you, and I hope to be kind of a little bit interactive about that. Um, because I think that's the only way that we can actually change thinking. Me standing here and lecturing at you is not going to change very much at all. So, I'm going to introduce some ideas uh, that I've learned actually quite recently from a carbon literacy course that I did. Um, 
which was sponsored by Manchester uh, A Certain Future. Uh, one of my colleagues here, Roster. Oh, yeah. um, and also um, some ideas of question based learning that I developed by simply observing my art students interacting with civil engineering students some time ago. For me, it all started in 1992 with the Earth Summit. Uh, can I just ask how many people here have been born since 1992? Well, you can put your hands up, you don't have to be shy. <laughs> well, <laughs> really well, it's quite interesting because just before Christmas I was giving a lecture to some architecture students. Um, and I was explaining that the impact that the Earth Summit had on me. Um, and I suddenly realised when I asked how many people were born since 1992, and everybody put their hand up, that I was actually talking to, forgive me, the climate changed generation. Yeah, so people that were born since 1992 have been born into this awareness of climate change. For me, and maybe for most of you I'll now gather in this room, um, although some of you are probably still too young to, to realise at the time, um, that idea about climate change and the impacts of climate change was of tremendous importance. And I realised that uh, I needed to find out how I could address this really, really big problem. The next thing I had to do was, as an artist, work out how I was going to contribute to this. Because certainly then, maybe still now, it seemed very much as a discourse of the sciences and politics. So, I've spent basically the past 22 years, trying to find out how I, as an artist, might actually engage with climate change. So that was a kind of starting point for me to sort of get onto this thing of what I might do as an artist. Now, when I was at art school, um, Nobody was actually able to tell me what art was, or how to define art. It's far too important, far too big, far too... You know, it was about human expression, it was about all sorts of different things, but actually finding a definition wasn't, just wasn't there. I'm going to squeeze through some slides now to show you a definition or two. Oh, sorry, that's me. Uh, does anybody know where that is? Hey, well done. <laughs> wow, that's, that's like a record breaking time. <laughs> People have spent ages working there. Okay. Walking that way tonight. So. Did, did you hear what the event was? Okay. It was in October 2009, and it was a um, 380 degrees event where I think it was. 9,000, no, 90,000 artists worldwide performed in some way or other as a contribution that was going towards the Copenhagen COP15 summit. Okay, so that has been in the cold and the rain. Um, what it doesn't show, in fact, is, is that be, behind me was a shop doorway um, and there's about 20 units in there. And I was actually reading a poem at the time, but um, had a, a chorus to it. If you like. And with these uh, 20 guys sort of doing this in the corner, <laughs> joining in. And that, that's what this, this girl over here was actually looking at. Um, so that, that was you know, moving towards different things, different ways of, of actually expressing something about climate change. It was raining a lot that day, too. Um, I've done some walks in Manchester called A Walk on the Wild Side, um, 
these are uh, high school kids uh, for the first time discovering um, that frog school. Um, absolutely disgusted by it, delighted by it, amazed by it. Um, they also then realised that things were changing in terms of this particular area, um, largely to do with their weather. So, we come on to this thing about ecology and art, because I call my practice ecological art. Um, the ecology bit, um, in 1992, um, I actually had to look it up in a dictionary to find out what it meant, because at that time, ecology wasn't a word that was regularly used you know, in, in normal speaking, in normal parlance. Um, and, and so, Oxford English Dictionary, I found out it was the study of organisms, their relationship to each other, and their relationship to their environment. It comes from the Greek word oikos, meaning dwelling, or house. So that's quite straightforward. You probably all know that anyway. What I was then interested in, through further research and reading, um, was coming across this word rita. And in fact, this is the root of our word art. It comes, um, it's a Sanskrit word, comes from the root Vedas. And it means the dynamic process by which the whole cosmos continues to be created virtuously. Um, now, if you think about the migration of the Indo-Aryan peoples through Europe, uh, this word ends up in ancient Greece as erete, and then comes through to us in English as art. In that particular definition, and that's still used in contemporary Hindi, I don't see sort of white wall galleries or theatre spaces or those kind of things to do with art necessarily. I see a far more open connectedness to evolution, maybe something closer to ecology. And so that fascinated me, and this actually gave me another kind of spur as to where my direction as an artist might go. The word also means the correct way of doing something, right, the right way of approaching something with excellence. That's the, the virtuous we do. Um, and in our language still, we use um, that term when we talk about um, the art of cooking, the art of football, um, perhaps the art of archery, um, the art of motorcycle maintenance perhaps, and even the art of war. So art could be doing something with excellence. In fact, doing anything with excellence, doing it in accordance with evolution. So it takes that whole idea of art somewhere else, for me at least, and perhaps starts to address some of the issues that we're now having to face because of environmental degradation and because of climate change. David, sorry, can you just dim the lights because the slides are a bit... These are just background rooms, oh, to be honest. Okay. Just curious. You can have the slides <laughs> later if you want. It's a prompt for me more than anything else. So, um, going back to the capable futures, I hope you can now start to see that there's a connection maybe between capable futures as opposed to sustainable development, which was a term that came out of the 1992 Rio summit, that sustainable development, in my opinion, was actually a lot more to do with maintaining the status quo of Western Northern Hemisphere 
business. It was sustaining things. It's the way people in developed countries like to see them. Why would they want to change them? However, the people living in the South and developing countries, perhaps sustainable development is not such a good thing. Because actually, if you're living below the poverty line, which two thirds of the world's population is, then actually sustaining that level of poverty is downright bad news. So if we also think about the whole business of ecological footprints, carbon footprints, and who's actually producing the stuff, I, I don't think anybody seriously disputes the fact that human beings are producing the acceleration of climate change. So if we take the fact that the acceleration of climate change is produced by the economics of our day, by the industry, by the commerce and business of our day, then if you're in the South, in a developing country, you might question actually what the benefits of this sustainable development are. And I suggest that maybe the term capable futures is perhaps something that might be considered as being more appropriate. In other words, how do we get out of the mess that we've managed to get ourselves into? Now, I'm not going to blind you with um, statistics and the science. Um, but there's a guy named uh, Kevin Anderson, who's a professor both at the University of Manchester and University of East Anglia, is director of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change. Okay? And he talks about the kind of mess that we're in as being really quite dramatic. Okay? There, there actually isn't any good news in it. Sorry about the introduction. I'm not going to instantly provide good news here. There isn't good news. Um, the reality is we're going to hit plus two degrees Celsius by the end of the century, whether we like it or not. We might even be getting to four degrees. Two degrees Celsius was considered to be um, approaching danger level in terms of the effects that it would have on us. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change revised that two years ago, said actually two degrees Celsius, plus two degrees Celsius, is very dangerous. Okay? Now, you know, we've had a few floods this winter, had the odd disaster and things. I don't think we've actually started to see the scale of things that are going to happen. So we can do lots of different things. We can um, hide in the corner, pretend that it's not happening. Um, we can run around madly, saying it's all disaster, I can't do anything about it. We can be very jolly about everything and just hope it goes away. Someone else's problem, maybe. Or, as presumably intelligent, creative, people who've had a lot of learning and knowledge and are preparing themselves or are engaging in their practices and their careers, we can actually start to address these issues and, if you like, make ourselves capable. So, there are two kind of things that I've, I've learned recently. Um, as I said, one was from a carbon literacy course that I was on about three weeks ago in time. 
Um, and as part of that, um, there was one exercise that really hit home for me. And this exercise, um, the facilitator was excellent, by the way. Um, and what we had to do was talk, face one other person and talk to them. But first of all, she said, one of you, in this case, I was the first person to do this, um, within our two cents, um, one of them is a councillor for Manchester City Council. The other one, oh, and sorry, the councillor is living in 2050. The other person is a person of today. And she said we had to close our eyes, we closed our eyes. And she gave us this um, description of how Manchester will be, how Manchester is in 2050. So, looking out of the window at Manchester in 2050, um, the first thing that we notice is that um, there are far fewer buses on Oxford Road. Buses that are there are all electric buses. We notice that actually uh, most of All Saints Park has now actually been turned over uh, to grow salads and vegetables and things that are served in the cafes and bars around the campus. Uh, we notice that actually behind the business school, where we are now, um, there's a wind farm. And all the energy from that is being used in the local area, probably at Burley Fields, actually. Uh, we notice that the solar panels that have been put on all the roofs throughout the whole campus, thank you, John, are now, in fact, powering all the electricity within the campus because the technology has increased to such a degree that they're far more efficient. We notice that um, actually the recycling bins are no longer needed because in fact most of the things that are being designed are designed without the packaging that was filling all the bins before. We find that people's clothing has actually been made from renewable materials. We see that, in fact, you know, the weather is still British weather. It is a little warmer, but it's okay. And she went on like this. She, designed, she described, uh, if you like, the idyllic city, the sustainable city. And then she said, okay, so the person playing the counselor of 2050 now has to tell the other person how it happened. Whoa, okay, um, how did it happen? Um, and I just started to talk. So, you know, I didn't know she was going to ask me this question. I, didn't. I just started to talk. And the thing I started to describe was that. Back in 2014, there had been massive floods. And in fact, in the summer of 2014, there was the return of a massive drought. And people were very dissatisfied. Because not only were they experiencing extremes of flooding, but they were then ex experiencing extremes of desertification starting to come in. And people were starting to take this very seriously. And there was massive unrest, in fact, around the world. And people were getting very angry. But instead of rioting, instead of doing those things that our media tends to look to, what was actually taking place was that people were just choosing to live differently. People were choosing a different lifestyle. People who had already started to grow their own food 
were starting to teach other people how to do things. People who were already not using their cards were starting to actually encourage other people. And so there was just this rise of a change. Initially, the banks and the politicians and the big industries were really, really worried because they could see a massive change taking place and they weren't prepared for it. They didn't know what to do. And in fact, the following year, in this country, there was an election and subsequent elections around the world started to elect different kinds of politicians. People started to buy different kinds of products. So the organic sections of Tesco's and Waitrose and Sainsbury's suddenly were actually all that was available because that's what people wanted. Anyway, I talked about this and it, and it, it sort of just struck me that um, actually I believe that there's a massive change taking place. I noticed that most of my students actually grow their own food, or grow some of their own food, starting to take charge of their own health care, starting to look to supplementing the education that's provided. And I believe there's a massive change taking place already. And that's the good news, because actually that's where the capabilities come in to address the changes that we're going to experience. And it's also about actually having an embedded experiential way of working with change. It's not about being told what to do, not about being made guilty, not about false hopes and things of that sort, but actually dealing with the issues. Now I mentioned, um, a good slide there. I mentioned 380 degrees earlier. Um, 380 degrees, 38 degrees as it happened, uh, two of the largest um, lobbying organizations in the world. Uh, 38 degrees, I think has just over 2 million people signed up to it. You must have all seen emails and things from them. Presumably, quite a lot of you here have actually responded to them, signed petitions. Actually stop the government from getting rid of forests at different times. Stop the government from doing other things that we consider destructive. Promoting things that we think are good. So it's quite interesting how the media is already working with people in that way as well, to support those kind of changes. Now I said earlier that um, I wasn't just going to talk at you, um, and this is the interactive bit. Okay? And again, this is something that um, I learned recently um, from um, a woman in London who was promoting food literacy, um, and it was, at, uh, a, a, it was at Greenpeace, and it was an event called um, The Art of Nature that I took part in. Um, and she did this next exercise. So, this is the point where you turn to the person next to you, if you can. Find, find the person next to you. So they won't bite. So I'd like you to spend three minutes telling each other about a really good place in the city. Do you all mind standing up? Now, I'd like you to 
find, if you can, two other people, so you make it groups of three, preferably without the person that you've just been talking to. Or people that you've been talking to. So go find two other people that you haven't talked to yet. So you've got to move. Sorry about it. <laughs> the three of you, I'd like you to tell each other about some aspect of climate change that you actually know. Ooh. So, I'd like you to change around again, find two people that you haven't talked to yet. <laughs> and now I'd like you to tell each other about some act of human goodness or kindness that you know about. <laughs> so, it's a good job it's the last question, or the last thing to consider. And what I'd like you to consider, and tell your other two friends, um, is what you might actually contribute, what you might actually take forward to the future. Okay, um, it was very interesting, particularly that last one, where everybody went, <laughs> what I going to say, and then actually, that was the one where voices started to get louder and louder, and people were talking more and more. Okay, the reason for me doing this is not just so that I have a rest from speaking. Um, the idea behind it is that actually, climate change is not something that's out there. Climate change is something that's in this room. And we have the capabilities of actually thinking about these things, talking to other people directly, strangers, about these things. And I believe we also have the capability of doing something about climate change. And it starts here, now. So you've just taken part in what is, on the one hand, an open space exercise. On the other hand, it's actually about your commitments, your ideas, as to how you're going to go forward to the future, and hopefully make some changes. Okay? So, thank you. <laughs>